you can also use it to make animal feeds. So by the end of the day, the whole of the process, there's no wastage and you have gotten the value of your money. Some of the nucleus farmers who are in partnership with government to distribute seedlings have also embraced value addition, citing the competitive economic benefits it offers. At Musubi Farm, the processing of Haas avocado into oil has already taken off. Currently in this facility, uh, no matter what you normally do, we normally receive the fruits from the sorting. After sorting, we normally bring them to the, to the production processing. Then from there, we normally process the fruits according to the different rods. If you receive one, one rod, uh, we normally process them in different rods. So normally, we, load, we normally load the fruits here so from this point. Then we normally pour it a, a sorting conveyor where the sorting happens uh, as, as it is being loaded. Eh? Then from there, With local our fruits are being washed here. Still so Farmers after washing, sure the fruits are then taken to the stoner the where the first separation happens. Eh? After the first separation, that's where we normally get the, the, the pulp and the seed and the cover. Thank you so much for keeping it NBS Live at 9. You've been a fantastic audience. You can keep abreast with all our products here on Next Media Services. There's something for everyone. Absolutely. Here on NBS Television, let's have a conversation about Uganda Aviation. And Mildred Tahise is on standby to give us that conversation and dig deeper. Mildred, what do you have for us tonight? Of course, uh, for those who love to travel, you want ease, you want smoothness. Remember those extortion issues that came through all through because and it was all thrown to Uganda Civil Aviation Authority forgetting that they have a number of clients in there but we're going to be discussing that and much more many of us have wanted to have a much better bigger departure lounge and uh, so many other another terminal that is in the offing at what percentage are we and a lot more of discussion with regard to the Uganda Civil Aviation Authority I think I have the entire top team with me here so if I, I carried out a coup on Uganda Civil Aviation Authority I would take up the entire authority. Anyway, that's just a joke. Let's take a look at our panel this uh, uh, evening. And of course, I'll be hosting this with uh, the lovely Timothy Nyangweso in just a bit, who you will be seeing. But first, let's take a look at who the panelists are this evening. Viani Mpungu Luja is the manager of public affairs and spokesman of Uganda Civil Aviation Authority. He is a member of the UCAA management team and has over 20 years experience in the aviation industry. A graduate of mass communication from Makere University, Luja holds a Master's of Arts in Journalism and Communication from the same university and an MBA from Uganda Matters University. He has over the years acquired competencies in the civil aviation management from Singapore Aviation Academy and skills in airport customer service quality management from Incheon International Airport among others. Prior to joining the aviation industry, he worked with MCL, Makkan, a PR and advertising agency and Uganda Telecom. He has also served as a member of the Board of Africa Chess Confederation and President of the Africa Zone 4.2. Luja has been at the helm of handling various stakeholder engagements, crisis management, and handling of local and international events in Uganda's aviation industry. In 2019, he was recognized by the International Civil Aviation Organization through the East African and South Africa Office with an Aviation Pioneer Award in recognition of the promotion of the global aviation's bodies, Platinum Jubilee.
And of course, uh, Vianney is right here with us and we would like to just say hello to him. And of course, we'll be expecting a lot of discussion from that time when uh, Uganda Civil Aviation was on the spot, but sometimes not for their own making, but because they house quite a number. A very good evening to you, uh, Vianney. Say hello to our viewers. Thank you very much, Mildred. A very good evening, viewers. It's a pleasure and honor for me to be here this evening. A pleasure to have you. Let's take a look at who our next panelist is. Mr. Richard Rujungu Ruhesi, Director, Aerial Navigation Services, Uganda Civil Aviation Authority. He is in charge of the directorate responsible for providing the services that ensure safe and efficient operations of aircraft in the Uganda airspace. He is a certified aviation engineer with vast experience in design, development and maintenance of aeronautical systems and management of aviation safety operations. He has served in various leadership positions in aerial navigation, supervising a team of highly skilled aviation professionals consisting of air traffic controllers aeronautical information management officers and aviation safety engineers. He holds a Master's of Science in Information Systems Engineering and a Bachelor of Engineering in Electrical and Electronic Engineering. With a rich working background in software development, aeronautical systems, airborne defensive aids, civil and military radar, embedded electronics, data communication and satellite-based applications. As a specialist in communication, navigation, and surveillance, he is involved at national level in multiple sectoral engineering projects such as airports, surveillance systems, satellite-based technologies, and the outer space policy. At the regional and international level, he is a member of several high technical working committees of ESC, COMESA, and Council. He is a member of the Aeronautical Frequency Spectrum Panel of ICAO and a leader in the subgroup of CNS, ATM Africa, Indian Ocean Planning and Implementation Regional Group, APIRG. Now, as technical as that uh, profile there was, we expect all the technical jargon and terms to be coming from uh, Richard here. But uh, we just want to say a very good evening to you, Mr. Rehesi. Say hello to our viewers. Uh, thank you. Thank you, viewers. Yes. Uh, thank you, Mildred. Uh, I, I hope we will fun. simplify the jargon and technical <laughs> language. Very, very We'll try as much as possible without distorting the... I love that <laughs> without distorting it. Let's take a look at who our next panelist is. Mr. Fred Keba Mwesije is the Director General of Uganda Civil Aviation Authority. He has an extensive experience in the aviation industry as the Authority's Deputy Director General. Prior to that, he served as the Authority's Director, Human Resource and Administration, a position he assumed in February 2009. Before joining the Authority, he worked with the National Environment Management Authority, NEMA, and also served as the Legal and Human Resource Manager with National Water and Switch Corporation. He is an experienced aviation management professional with competencies in senior civil aviation management, managing aviation policy and regulation, transport economics, and managing airport operations and air navigation services, all attained from the Singapore Aviation Academy. His experience in the corporate management and quality assurance spans over 25 years of service. Mr. Bamwesje is an advocate of High Court of Uganda with a Master's of Arts in Development Studies specializing in Human Resources Management from the Hague School of Development Studies in Netherlands. He holds a Diploma in Business Management from the University of Manchester, a Postgraduate Diploma in Legal Practice from the Law Development Center and a Bachelor's of Law degree from Makerere University. <laughs> And uh, some of us could be getting a little bit confused, an advocate of the High Court, a lawyer at that, now heading the Uganda Civil Aviation Authority. That's how dynamic uh, our next panelist is. And uh, Mr. Vamwesija, just say hello to our viewers. Yeah, good evening, uh, Mildred, and uh, good evening, viewers. Once again, I'm, like, uh, I'm happy to be here to continue to explain the state of the aviation. Mm. industry in Uganda mm. and I'm looking forward to have a good interaction with the viewers and also uh, all other Ugandans. Thank you. 
All right. Yes, that's very true. And we're coming to you live on NBS television, but also coming to you live on UBC TV, inspiring Uganda. I am not alone. The other person is not a panelist. He is my co-host, and that is none other than Timothy Nyangwe. So, Tim, a good evening to you. Good evening, and I'm excited. I hope our uh, seat belts are fastened and we're going to take off to be able to see how this aviation uh, is done in this country. Yeah. Knowing very well that in 1991, that's when Uganda Civil Aviation kicked off to be able to do the things it did and also looking at some of the amendments that happened within this country. But I'll start with the Director General. Uh, as Civil Aviation Authority, where are we? Where are we coming from? And where are we going? But let me also put it into context that you help us understand. We are post-COVID. How are we as Civil Aviation Authority? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Nyangweso. Thank you very much, uh, Mildred, for this chance. Once again, it is always a, a pleasure to share with countrymen and women on how the state of the aviation industry is. Of course, as you all know, aviation industry has been in existence uh, Uganda became a contracting state of ICAO in 1967. Since that time, we became part and parcel of the Global Aviation Fraternity. And in 1991, as you rightly said, we had the first law, the first primary registration establishing Civil Aviation Authority in Uganda. In uh, later, this, this was amended, but all those are amended to continue to harmonize our system with the global system of aviation. But as you know, we've been operating smoothly until COVID came in. Mm. That is in 2019, yes. 2020. And of course, there was a lot of disruption in the aviation industry. Probably one of the sectors that were hard hit by, by the pandemic. And we continued to operate, although it was, uh, it was disruptive. The airport and other aviation facilities were open because we had to handle emergencies and repatriations and many overflights. So we kept open, but passenger services were not really uh, normal commercial passengers were not coming to the airport were not using them therefore we do not have revenues at that time except for the cargo cargo side but still we sustained the industry the team and the others who, who are there and we kept operating until uh, these restrictions for covid were eased and we started operating slowly, slowly. Uh, we started by operating at around 10%, mm. 28%. We came to 50 Now we are in the region of 80% operational uh, compared to pre-COVID uh, levels of operation. Mm. We are now moving at that level. In, in, mm. in simpler terms, um, if looking at pre-COVID in terms of probably traffic, and not operation capacity in terms of traffic and how many people were exiting and coming through um, the airspace, uh, Uganda's airspace, and currently where we are, which numbers are we talking about? And are we about to hit the pre-COVID? Have we surpassed them or we're still hoping to? Uh, the situation has, yes, we have improved greatly because the last figures, consistent figures we had uh, was in the month of April, I think we had slightly over 4,000 passengers per day. Pre uh, previously, uh, before COVID, we were actually having 5,000 5, passengers per day. So we are about ready to get to those numbers of pre-COVID. Surprisingly, we were looking at the figures of May, mm. and we found actually the figures of May are now 5,000. Uh, again. Okay. But of course, those are some of the figures we get when we have big uh, uh, days or big uh, activities like mm. this, uh, 
movement to well, Mother's Day, movement Saudi Arabia for the Muslim programs. Those could not be relied on as consistent, but we get them once in a while, like Christmas time. Mm. You get more, more figures of passengers, but you can't say that now you are at those levels of passengers, except, of course, uh, uh, in the months, for instance, of January, after December, you see uh, figures getting down again. So consistency is determined over several months. So right now, mm. we are recovering. We are somewhere around 80% okay. recovery. Thank you very much, uh, Director General. Let me come to Director Richard. You know, a lot is said about navigation, about airspace, mm -hmm. and the terminologies seem very difficult to understand. I'm hoping that an ordinary Ugandan outside there, you can be able to put some meaning for us to be able to understand it, and what happens in navigation, what happens in airspace, and break down those terminologies for us to be able to understand. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, the term, I don't think I can exhaust the terminologies of navigation in this. <laughs> there are uh, quite many. Yeah, yeah, very many. Mm. But um, um, I think the, the, um, our viewers maybe need to uh, know that what air navigation as such as a service is. Most of our viewers are most likely familiar with uh, airports. Airports is the most common service and our, our mandate as CAA is uh, we've got, we provide and we develop airports, but then we also offer a service called air navigation services. And this service is the service uh, that you'd broadly call the airspace, airspace management. Mm. This is a service that allows the uh, orderly operations within the airspace safe and efficient in such a way that uh, aircraft move from place to place Whole from, one, of from airport off. to the other mm. for instance an, an, an aircraft uh, needs to uh, take off from an airport uh, uh, go out to a taxi out to the runway take off along the runway fly uh, a, a route through several phases of flight and uh, in the same way when landing come through a similar process so these are the areas we look at. Maybe just for the purpose of uh, understanding, it, it, I could break down those services a little bit more. Mm. Um, among those services that we offer, <coughs> I could say, I'll, I'll mention about, I'll break them down into about four, is we've got uh, the core service, which is the air, air, airspace management, which is the air traffic management, normally called ATM. This is the service, these are the personnel and uh, systems that enable aircraft uh, fly they give the instructions, they've got the procedures, they uh, interact with the, air, with the pilots, essentially. And they give all these instructions, they go through a, a, a regime, they've got a systems that they manage and are able to separate aircraft, keep aircraft from uh, coming close to each other, basically smoothly <coughs> flying in the airspace. Then we've got a, a service what, that we call the CNS. You'll hear time and again people talk about CNS. CNS is communication, navigation and surveillance. And these are broken down, if I break them any further, is communication is the means by which we talk uh, uh, the, the aviation public, the aviation users talk to each other. A lot of it is by voice, by data, that's communication and there's all sorts of means of providing that. Then there's uh, the service called navigation. Navigation in, 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 in aviation terms is the uh, ability to know where you are. For an, for an aircraft flying out there would need to know where they are in the airspace of the world. Mm -hmm. So navigation is that method by which, and this is also supported by instruments and other. There's also surveillance. Those who, uh, the common thing about surveillance is, for instance, radar is where, where some, uh, the ability for you, who is uh, on the ground, know, to know where the aircraft is in the air. That is what we call surveillance. Mm -hmm. And this is provided by common services like radar. But then in order to put all these together, we've also got a service called aeronautical information management. This is a service that provides information to the in, entire industry. This information is collected from all sources. It's uh, 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 distributed in a very systematic way, in a standardized way worldwide, and it is uh, provided by service. An example of this service would be a briefing office. For instance, before an aircraft takes off, there's certain information they must get. And uh, okay, I won't go through all those, but the, among the key information elements that they get are the, other than the routes and the destinations and whatever, is the weather. So we also coordinate a, a, a service called uh, aeronautical meteorology. Meteorology. Mm -hmm. This is commonly known as MET. We'll also hear them refer to it as MET. But this is the information required 
about weather. Well, weather is a very mm. uh, important phenomenon in flight. It supports landing, takeoff, and uh, is quite uh, critical. They also provide... Sorry, let yeah. me stay with you. And yeah. you have given us these four services. Yes. But let me ask a basic question. Uh, MH370, the Malaysian flight that disappeared, also are there black spots that you can be, not be able to navigate this plane and know that you know, it, within this space the plane will disappear? And what are you doing about such technology? You can give us a background of how the MH370 disappeared, but also tell us if there are black spots where planes, you have no navigation of them. Yeah, okay, the, the, the MH370 is an, is an example of a disappear. I'll look at it from the point of control, air traffic control. Okay. This, uh, the, the, the air traffic controllers were seeing it on the radar, mm -hmm. or on the uh, air traffic management system, and it disappeared. Normally, mm -hmm. when an aircraft uh, ceases to be seen, but says no signal, or has a distress signal, it changes status. So it changes from an ordinary flight to a distressed flight, so it goes into what is called search and rescue mode. Mm. So uh, this is it's a, it's a common phenomenon, but it's not. Uh, um, it, it's happened. Uh, it happens a lot. Of, I mean, many times, but not all. Not all of them turn into the catastrophe that we had with the, you know, the MH370. The but uh, uh, that leads me to another service that uh, we offer, which is the coordination of search and rescue, because the air traffic controllers are normally the last people, or the last people to have communication with the aircraft. They are charged. We are charged with the that uh, 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 task of coordinating the search and rescue. Because everybody, we, it will be a point of contact to know where the aircraft last, uh, um, was last seen. So we would have the information. Our air traffic controllers or our system, because it is normally recorded, would have that. And the other service maybe <coughs> I didn't mention <coughs> is that we also coordinate with the military. Uh, the nature of the airspace uh, in Uganda and many states is the uh, is, is, uh, joint on the air, uh, airspace. Mm. So the airspace... Well, security reasons yeah, as well. Yeah, the airspace is owned normally by, by the state and operated by the civil aviation yeah. or the air, air navigation service provider like ourselves. So we are charged also with that civil military coordination to ensure smooth operation amongst us. Okay. And services. And on the whole, okay, the, the definition of the airspace, of airspace per se, is uh, it's got boundaries. It's got the boundaries, and in our case, it is the boundary of uh, the territorial boundary. Ours is shaped in the form of our territorial boundary as Uganda, okay. those who are familiar with it. Mm -hmm. And then in the, uh, uh, going upwards, it is up to 100 kilometers. And that is what is called airspace. That's what we manage. Okay. Uh, That's interesting. The only I want to come to you. Earlier on, the DG talked about traffic in terms of uh, passengers. And it's good news that we're literally almost coming back to the pre-COVID numbers, mm -hmm. but there is cargo traffic, which is also a very important aspect because we are not only using airport, um, air, the airspace to transfer passengers, move from one place to another, but it's also another means of transport in terms of cargo. We are talking about export promotion here. The perishables and all that perishables depend on is the quickest and safest means of transport, which is air transport itself. How are we faring with cargo traffic, but also transportation, the ease? Because we've seen so many exporters talking about delays in the flights and most of their perishables going bad. Uh, thank you very much, Mildred. In terms of cargo traffic, you can say if we compare to 1991, when Uganda Civil Aviation Authority had just been established, mm. Entebbe International Airport handled 6,600 metric tons of cargo. When you compare that to 2022, we handled 61,000 metric tons of cargo. The numbers were a little higher prior to COVID 2019. It was 64,000 metric tons of cargo. It slightly reduced in 2020 to 59,000 metric tons, but cargo did not reduce as much as passenger traffic, partly because of what he alluded to, the fact that cargo operations were sustained even during the COVID times. In fact, during that time, uh, airlines tried a lot of innovation. Because cargo operations were permitted, there were air operators that reconfigured passenger aircraft to be used to carry cargo. And that was one of the survival modes adopted during that time of 2020. But when you look at the bulk of Uganda's cargo, it's mainly exports. Exports are more than imports. 
and that is good news for Ugandans because it is an opportunity for especially farmers because when you look at most of the exports that we handle through the International Airport, it comprises of fresh produce including fish, flowers, vegetables and that kind of thing. So that is an opportunity for Ugandan farmers in that area. But moving back a little bit on the passenger traffic that he actually tackled, uh, just the figures of May that he mentioned that were as high as the ones of uh, pre-COVID, 5,000 passengers per day. The interesting part about May is that uh, we registered 79,000 arrivals and 77,000 departures. So May is the one month where we have registered more arrivals than departing passengers. Most of these months prior to May, we have been registering more departing passengers. So the fact that we have got more arrivals in May is an interesting phenomena, but is partly attributed to the returning pilgrims from Umrah mm -hmm. that he actually mentioned during that particular time. Okay, and, and I was also a little bit interesting, away from just May, looking at the statistics of the numbers that we have, uh, departures and arrivals as well, what do these comprise of? Are these just tourists? Is it business related? And, and also, I was, um, I was earlier on uh, talking to um, Mr. Rehesi and asking, how about our departures? Do we have more of those going uh, to the UAE to, in search for jobs? What is the, when, when you try to break down our departures and arrivals, what does it look like? The bulk of passengers is largely tourists. But the categorization of tourism is mm -hmm. what also needs to be looked at in another way. Uh, while the bulk is generally known as tourists, even people who come for business or conferences mm -hmm. eventually end up being tourists. Because someone comes to attend a conference and in the evening they visit the zoo or a tourist attraction. So, but we, we generally say that the bulk is tourists, but we have business people we have people coming for conferences, and of late, Uganda is hosting a lot of conferences, and that is also helping our traffic. When it comes to departures, the most popular destinations for Ugandans include UAE, Nairobi, China, also used to rank quite high. Interestingly, South Africa is also among those top five destinations, as well as UK. So those, in terms of people departing Uganda, are major destinations that we have our people going to. Okay, and maybe before Timothy comes in, you talk about departures, and at departure is an aspect of convenience. I want to be able to come through, I want to check in, I want to have a smooth sail and be able to go. And DJ, I want to come to you, because uh, a few months ago, it wasn't all rosy, because what was in, in, the, in the media space, social media was extortion tendencies, people missing flights, and delays. That went down. Many people get to say Uganda is a, not a blockbuster movie. They, we keep having a series. So something different happens at a different time and the other is shadowed away. How did we conclude on that? And is it seamless now to say? I want to say that, the, uh, and I have said it before, uh, this, this I have said it before. It has been widely reported that extortions are in the airport and there are quite a lot of inconveniences uh, because of so many uh, handlers and all that. Yes, partly true uh, and as you earlier on said, we have quite a lot of uh, stakeholders within our aviation facilities and it is not just civil aviation that handles passengers in the airport. You know very well, you have immigration, you have security, you have cargo handlers, you have passenger handling agencies, you have airlines, and a combination of all this. Of course, when COVID came, we also had other desks that were not typical aviation, like health desks. You also, because of these uh, workers that are going to Middle East, you also have a labor desk, and so on and so forth. Because of those, there were a multiplicity of desks and uh, operators that uh, for some time we, we coordinated but could not largely lift them to do their mandate. But now it turned out that some of them increasingly became an inconvenience. And we totally came out 
told the Ugandans that we cannot continue like this, uh, apologized where we could, and did uh, put measures mainly to do away with those desks that are not typical of an airport operation, like health desk, like uh, labor desk, uh, the other one was the uh, vaccination desk, and so on and so forth, and we removed them. We streamlined security totally, streamlined uh, immigration, put restrictions on uh, movements within the airport, and left each uh, stakeholder to do their part. And some of the requirements, like COVID certificates, could not be allowed unless unless they are required by the country of destination. Uh, those that could be checked by airlines, we restricted them to airlines. Things like visas, we left them with, with the immigration. So now we streamlined the whole place. We stopped people to walk around with phones if they were not supervisors. And we enforced them. Right and now... I want to take a selfie time to travel and I'm very excited. Yes, selfie because you are a passenger you can take a selfie. We don't we don't stop to stop that except if you go in restricted areas. And restricted areas are not really for only in the international airport. Every place, even by the way, not in the airport, even in this building I am sure there are places where I'm not allowed to go and start taking pictures. Mm. So that is a feature of every establishment that we do, we do. But for passengers, there are those passenger areas that they are required. They do that almost every other day. Take pictures, feel happy, do all sorts of things, and go. But we, of course, we can't allow you to take pictures in security restricted areas. But for the workers there who are not supervisors, because of uh, those malpractices, we restricted their phones phones to only supervisors. Mm. And we shall observe that until we continue to see progress, until then maybe we could think about uh, really, uh, relieving the, the, those restrictions, trying to, 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 to go through on them. But for now, that's what has happened, and it is a very, very seamless experience as of now. The other matter that is still not, uh, of course, you know very well, in the whole airport, we are constructing, we are modifying, mm -hmm. we are doing all sorts of things. And we once again want to thank airport users for the patience they have had with us. Because we want to modernize these facilities and be modernized the level at how an airport should be. You can see we are working on the departures. We have got a twin road system that will take us up to the and we have even a canopy now. We are constructing a canopy where people will come and be able to enter into an airport without uh, being, uh, if, if, say, if it is raining, they will have to move towards the airport without uh, any, any problem of rain. And when they are coming back, same thing uh, downstairs. But before we complete that, there is still an inconvenience of reaching the airport departure area is still a little bit of a problem. But we are really moving very fast, and soon we shall complete and allow our passengers to reach the airport. How soon is the airport. Soon? We thought actually by now we should have completed. And it is being done by our partners, the UPDF uh, Engineering Engineers Brigade. But I think in the importation of, 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 of finishing uh, uh, tires and other things, we are not, they, they delayed a little bit. So we, we shall wait for another two months. Uh, maybe uh, we should be able to complete by end of August. And this was not our making. Yeah. I keep uh, telling them. Inside there, if you have been there, you can see we expanded uh, uh, check-in areas totally, and now there are many. We expanded the immigration area. We went in two insides in the, in the waiting lo lounges and made them open, an open long system, and expanded the duty-free area. Really, when you enter, you find that we have done quite a lot of things. And we are continuing. 
to do many things. Uh, probably I will have a chance to explain oh. more as time goes on. Okay. Yes. Come back to that, uh, Director General. But, uh, Director <laughs> Richard, let me come to you. One of the things that every ordinary Ugandan that goes through Entebbe is the hectic movement from departure to actually leaving. September 2022, you had commissioned automation in there. $9.5 million by the Korean International Corporation Agency. What does this mean, and why are we not feeling this happening within the airport? Um, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I think the, the project that you're referring to is uh, a project uh, of modernization of Inter International Airport that was uh, supported by uh, our partners from uh, the Republic of South Korea. This, as you say, indeed, it was a $9.5 million project. And it uh, covered many, it actually uh, covered many improvements within the airport, and mainly operational improvements. Operational improvements that uh, uh, point towards uh, safety and efficiency. I can take you th maybe through the, the, the components of that project. One of them was a compliance matter, where we, as part of our mandate, we, we need to distribute information. This information, uh, aeronautical information, needs to be distributed all over the country and then distributed uh, 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 to the rest of the world in, a, in an international format. So we had a system, it's called an uh, automatic message handling system. This was installed, it's a system that is, uh, we were for the first time in the, in the region to have it implemented, and it has improved uh, our coordination, air, air, airport coordination uh, tremendously, it, within the country and uh, outside. We, uh, as part of that project, we also had um, a, a, a terminal, Operating Control Center, a TO, we call it a TOCC. This TOCC is a one-stop center. If you've been to the airport, maybe you'd have opportunity to come and have a look. Is that many of our operations, it may not be very visible, but in-house, in it actually made a, a difference. Is that many of our operations were uh, scattered, were all distributed all over within several offices. All of them have been centered into a, something called a TOCC, a Terminal, Terminal Operation Control Center. And it is a, a common practice now at many airports so we've managed to get that uh, uh, working. All the, operation, all, all the operations are controlled in one room. You're able to monitor what's going on within the airport, not only by camera, but data, the information exchange and everything is, can be done. This has behind it, it has a, it's driven by a database, an, uh, an airport database system. Uh, in the same project, we had also some other infrastructure uh, improvements, which. Uh, uh, obvious. I think if you've been to the airport, you'll see some very large screens that will provide information. There are uh, very modern uh, screens that provide passenger information. Some of them are not yet commissioned They're under in a new building, but these are there. We also had uh, within that um, a CCTV system. Uh, the, 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 the way uh, Entebbe is, Entebbe Airport is, is that from the control tower, you're not able to see the entire aerodrome. You're not able to see the entire airport. There are areas, the critical nature of a critical part to the operation that you can't see. So we got a CCTV system that enables us to see nearly all, all, all the whole area. Not, not only airplanes, even the operations on the ground. It's for airplanes, it's the taxiway, the, 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 uh, mainly the taxiways, one of the runways, um, the, the, the taxiways and uh, uh, the maneuvering areas are uh, able to be seen by that. Let's, let's widen the scope. One, why isn't this experience felt by the stakeholders? Because you're talking about operations and you're talking about systems and infrastructure put in place. But secondly, does this system also help coordinate the other airdromes that are across the country, the 13 that we're talking about? The aerodromes, all of those aerodromes are now connected to this system. Uh, the, the way it's done is uh, we do it systematically. So we, for those that are manned, for, for, you to, for, for this service to work, you have to have people at this airport. So for those uh, several airports that are manned, this system is, is distributed over there. The, 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 when you say that uh, the, maybe the stakeholders don't feel it, they do. They, 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 it is, it is, there's a smooth operation that uh, is felt. A lot of data, the collection of data, is much, much easier than it was uh, four years ago when we started this project. A lot of the, what was paper data, a lot of it has been digitized. And it is, you're able in one place to get a lot, all the information that you need. So the, the airport operators, this is mainly, this was to assist the airport stakeholders. 
uh, of course, uh, we, if the airport stakeholders are uh, feeling it, then the passengers get it indirectly. Mm -hmm. But this information is essentially assisting the operation of the, the airport. When I'm in Soroti, yeah. I can be able to get the information that is in Entebbe. When you're in, um, if yes. I have flown from Entebbe to Soroti or Entebbe to Mbara, whichever of these airdromes I have gone to, can I be able to get the same information that is relayed in Entebbe in Soroti? Yes, the, the system is linked, but uh, the way the air operations work is that you only take the information that you need. You will be given information that as soon as you, for instance, when you take off from, Sor from Entebbe going to Soroti, as soon as you take off, that same system will relay everything about your flight to Soroti immediately, and they'll be expecting you. The same would happen if, uh, if uh, in Arua, you, uh, you, you, you file a flight plan from Arua, you load all your information in there, that information will automatically very quickly, instead of being relayed by phone or by radio, it will go uh, by, uh, by digital, digital means to Entebbe, and it will be part of the database. So the operations are, uh, would benefit from that, is that it reduces the workload of the uh, controllers, it reduces the workloads yeah. of the officials. All right, yes, yeah. we yeah. wanted to respond. One component of that project, uh, which uh, dealt with the capacity building, mm. training of the staff manning those systems, and very, very, very well, we have actually some of the, 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 the global experts in the country because of that system. And uh, we are not lacking. We don't have uh, expatriates there. All people manning it, our own staff. And they are Ugandans. Interesting. Yes. Yeah, let, me, let me come to you. Uh, one of the things that really was interesting with the debacle that happened at the airport with all this social media there. One, extortion, then you said people should put on uniforms, they should keep their phones away, and then you had a whole press conference. But what is your public relations strategy, especially to get ahead of such stories and not detriment the reputation of the civil aviation? Uh, thank you very much. We enforce what we call proactive communication and that is what we prefer. By sharing information with the public in advance, but like the saying goes, uh, good news sometimes does not spread as much the as the bad news. So while we keep sharing the good news as and when it happens, as well as the developments that are being shared, for instance, here, when it comes to massive saturation of information, when bad news happens, it tends to spread wider than the good news. And that is why sometimes you have seen the bad news spreading a little more. But nevertheless, while we do the proactive engagement, when the bad news does spread, we also engage the public fully by providing the right information, like we did in this particular case, whereby we were able to share the measures that we had put in place as an airport, and the public was able to appreciate and understand the situation that we are going through. And yes. Let me say with you before I hand you over to Mildred. Yes. If you're building a discipline, you don't wait to grow fat to go to the gym. I feel like civil aviation waits to grow fat, then goes to the gym to try this discipline. At what point do you start to give this information to the public that this is what we do? Because when I look at some of your uh, core values, customer care, accountability, teamwork, efficiency, innovation, integrity, it sounds like an oxymoron, one direction, and your communication is going in another direction. Why? Uh, not, not at all. We actually enforce those values that you are seeing, and we, in our communication as well, we communicate them by bringing out the things that we do on a regular basis. If, for instance, you visit our social media handles, they are very active with uh, a lot of the things that we do on a regular basis. And that is part of the enforcement of the things that we are doing and communicating in the public domain. Okay, now I want to come to the DG because for you to operate an authority as civil aviation, there is a force of the law. And uh, there's been a recent amendment that was assented to by President Yoram Seveni. In most cases, we normally see change of name, and that is what is highlighted. So we moved from civil aviation to Uganda Civil Aviation Authority. But 
what do the amendments there in mean for the aviation industry in terms of um, enhancement of safety? Because we've always been told since primary school the safest and quickest means of transport is air transport. And unfortunately, when there is a glitch, it is a disaster. So what do these amendments mean to your work and providing this sort of safety uh, to the passengers? Yes, I, I, I said it earlier that the, this law, the, what we call primary registration, the Uganda Civil Aviation Authority Act, came into existence in 1991. Over the years, of course, that mother law is part and part of of the operationalization of what we call the Chicago Convention. Because aviation is global, as you know. Chicago Convention is a global legal instrument that was promulgated, and all states, all contracting states, as are implementing it with its annexes, it, it is operated by annexes, now 19 annexes. And they are all operated by different countries by domesticating what is provided in that in that is those legal instruments to their own situations in the country. So because of, the, of a long time, there were many, many, many promulgations coming out of ICAO, the global regulator, but also changing situations. So we were able to bring them together and put them, amend our, our own Civil Aviation Authority primary registration, the Civil Aviation Authority Act, and update it to include those provisions. And what are they? Other than the, what you are saying, changing the name mm -hmm. from Uganda, from Civil, Civil Aviation, Aviation Authority, Authority to yeah. Uganda Civil Aviation Authority. Again, that one was, of course, consistent with the practice everywhere. You have Kenya Civil Aviation Authority, Tanzania Civil Aviation Authority, Rwanda Civil Aviation Authority, even the UK, all those, so we harmonized that. And therefore, the, what used to be managing director became director general, because that is the nomenclature mm -hmm. for aviation. Okay. But beyond that, quite a lot of, of amendments were made to strengthen to strengthen the mandate of safety and security in aviation. For instance, I would say that early alone, we are not provided for, say, an accident investigation unit. Even when we had work means were there to put it in place, it was based in Uganda Civil Aviation Authority. Yet, that accident investigation unit is supposed to be independent and among the, the, the investigation, the, the agencies to be investigated when an accident happens is Uganda Civil Aviation Authority mm -hmm. because it is in charge of oversight of the industry. Maybe the accident was caused by lapses in oversight. Mm -hmm. And now you can't have it and be the one in charge. So it has to be independent. That was enforced and now it is in place oh. and it is in the Ministry of Works. There were also rule regulations to do with the delegation of powers from the ministry to Uganda Civil Aviation Authority. ICAO or the, the system of ICAO believes that these safety provisions can be enforced very close to the area of operations. So it was seen that when the powers are within the ministry, they are too far from the industry. Mm -hmm. So they were given to the authority through Director General and even Director General has to delegate them to specific inspectors on who are on the ground. Mm -hmm. So that actions take safety actions, force safety enforcement actions take place immediately, including surveillance, spot on surveillance, or actions that will make you enter, say, an industry or an operator without first giving notices, because you can see that there is some safety infringement in that operator. Within that operator, it could be an aerodrome operator, it could be an airline, 
it could be a maintenance organization, it could even be a training school. And you see something, we must go there quickly and force it. Mm. Those powers were not there before. You could also revoke a license you have already given. If in your own estimation you think that ever since the license was given, there are now certain infringements on safety of an, uh, say an operator who could be an owner of an aerodrome, could be an airline, could also be any other, and you see that, yes, I approved them to operate with this license, yeah. with these conditions, but I need now to strengthen, to strengthen the conditions okay. for me to keep abreast with now the new safety challenges. All those provisions are there. There are many, there are many. Mm. I, I don't think that this place can allow me to talk about them. And even now we are not saying that we have, we have, we are done. Every day in aviation, every day comes with its own challenges regarding safety of aviation and even security. So uh, any time, once we see a safety critical uh, uh, lacuna that, can, that, that need to be registered on, we actually come in and quickly include it. And, and just actually before we take a break, Timothy, I want to <coughs> engage um, Director Reasi on the same. On some of the recent developments in the air navigation space that you've taken to ensure security, because when we're talking about safety and security in with air transport, it is as real as it can sound, because in case of anything, it is as, as fatal as not being able to get even one single survivor. What are some of these developments that you've adopted and how are they going to help enhance safety and security in service provision? Yeah, thank you very much. In terms of service provision, there's many, we've implemented so many. Uh, maybe um, to put it in context, the, the, as the Director General was saying, is the civil aviation system is uh, global. The plans are at a global level. So you, other, you, you, yeah. you plan, it is planned at a global level, ah. uh, implemented at a regional level. We then have to coordinate with our uh, neighbors uh, in the region. It, uh, then uh, they, we then uh, have the national implementation. So for all of these uh, Im the implementations that have been recommended at the global level, we have implemented. An example I would uh, um, give is uh, we've implemented one of the highest priorities of ICAO, which is uh, called uh, performance-based navigation. And this mm. is the transition. It's a transition from the ground-based systems. These ones I've been talking about. The things that are based on the ground for navigation, where the, the, the aircraft and the specification of the, 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 the flying system is, uh, is now, uh, uh, based on its uh, specification, can now um, utilize the space better. So we get to a better efficiency for the airspace. An example is that we are able, for instance, to fly very smooth and efficient flights into the country. An example is that uh, when you fly into Uganda, anybody flying in our, in our airspace will tell you the the, 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 the main benefit is that you fly uh, what are called direct routes. You can, as soon as you get to the border, you will then fly direct to Entebbe. It's like flying, uh, going down a slope, very smooth flight. Those who have experienced it know it. Is that uh, we've, we, the, the, in the past you'd, you'd, uh, you'd feel an aircraft going down. You'd go in steps. If you fly within our airspace, we've modernized our airspace such that uh, you, uh, you, you just come straight in. Mm. We've also um, uh, implemented some parallel routing. All of these uh, add the efficiency of flight in the, and uh, reduce uh, fuel burn. All of the, these measures reduce fuel burn, they uh, reduce noise, uh, they're more efficient, they're quiet, they are uh, cost effective and efficient and arrival on time. So all those benefits are really some of the benefits that are uh, the, the industrial, the air users are getting from some of these implementation. We've done so many other things, but that is a, a one of the core, uh, one of the key um, priorities of ICAO that okay. we've uh, implemented. Uh, I, I love that uh, in the conversation, Timothy, uh, the, co the discussion is there is a lot more, there is a lot that we're doing. I think we need to hear much more. Either we're not, we not scooping it enough or we're not just getting to know. But well, we need to be taking a very short commercial break. When you do return, myself and Timothy will be continuing with this particular conversation. But if you're joining us online and in case you have any question, hashtag Spotlight UG. We are live on NBS television and live on UBC TV. Let's get back in a bit.
the Uganda Aviation Expo 2023 from the 22nd to the 24th June at Entebbe Airport is your chance to see, touch and experience a joyride in an aircraft. Entrance is 50,000 Uganda shillings and the flight 200,000 Uganda shillings for VIP 300,000 Uganda shillings. Transport up to 1 o'clock is free with double-decker buses pick-up points at City Square, Express Highway Busega and Namboli. Book now and enjoy. Momo Pay, Star 165, Star 3, Hush or Momo App 173278 or Airtel Money 0707 The payment message with the transaction number is your ticket to the Air Expo and makes you eligible to win a trip to Dubai, Zanzibar or South Africa. Come see, touch and view the Airbus and many other aircrafts. The Uganda Aviation Expo 2023. Steady. Be better. Your finances, safety, security is very, very important. Just be alert to anyone who calls you, trying to take good care of you by saying that they have sent you money. Do not release anything. Your PIN, your password, your information. They pretend to love us so much that they are calling from different telecommunication companies. No one just gives you money for free. Don't fall for the scammers. There are so many in this country, so stand up against them. Let them go make their own money. Better steady, be better. Better steady, be better. In partnership with Uganda Communications Commission, Bank of Uganda, Equity Bank, MTN Uganda, United Media, Stombic Bank, MTN Momo, and Uganda Bankers Association. MTN Uganda presents Saka Fribos, King of the East, also recognized by the Kabaka of Uganda. We talk Palasso. Yeah. Palasso in a love. On the 9th of June at the Cricket Oval, 20k ordinary, 50k VIP tables go for 3 million shillings. For discounted tickets, use the MTN mobile money by dialing star 165 star 98 hush. For 15k ordinary and 45k VIP. On Saturday the 10th of June, Mbara Ajif Motel. Sunday 11th of June, Fort Potter Grounds. Friday 16th of June, Ruero Grounds. Saturday 17th of June, Ginger Trans Garden. Sunday 18th of June, Mubi. Bende Stadium, organized by Sawa Bulu Badam. Come and witness the best concert of a new generation. Miss at your own risk. Sponsored by Pepsi Cola, Century Property Royal Estate, Mango Safari, Protea Hotel, Radio Home, and MTN. <laughs> Today, be better. Seven out of ten of us have lost a substantial amount of money to fraudsters. Money we could have used to pay rent, invest in small businesses, clear fees, or send to mama in the village. Better study and protect what's yours by being vigilant with your virtual transactions. Keep your pin to yourself and only take calls from registered customer care numbers in case of telecom issues. Better study, be better. Better steady, be better. In partnership with Uganda Communications Commission, Bank of Uganda, Equity Bank, MTN Uganda, United Media, Stombic Bank, MTN Momo, and Uganda Bankers Association. Feel like a little waiki bender? No aji on tare? Then open your Afro mobile app, go to options section, select radio, find the station that best suits your current mood, click on it and enjoy life without missing a beat. Take a piece of home with you anywhere and anytime. Afro mobile, the future is now.
Welcome back and thank you so much for keeping it NBS Television and UBC TV inspiring Uganda. For Spotlight Editions, discussions such as this, we get to partner together to ensure that a greater number of Ugandans can be able to pay attention. This evening, our conversation is about the Uganda Civil Aviation Authority, what we are doing to become better, what we are doing to align with the international standards as we continue to deal with our own airspace right here in Uganda. I am not alone as Mildred Sohaise. I am with Timothy Nyangwe. So back to you, sir. And I'm, I'm very grateful that uh, we be able to discuss these things, especially if you're getting to travel in and out of the country, the region or abroad. Your safety is paramount and efficiency both at the airport and the airdromes is very important for all of us there. But let's jump into this conversation. And uh, I think I'd like to start with uh, Director Richard, especially we're here chatting about technology and looking at uh, there's all this cyber crime, there's all this artificial intelligence, uh, concerns about, you know, can the flight and the navigation go off? How safe are we, especially with technology as a country, uh, how safe are we for me to be able to move in country and out of the country? Can I intercept and somehow disorganize mm. the systems a little bit? As an IT expert. Well. It is, uh, all those have uh, possibilities, but we try as much as possible to uh, eliminate them if we can, or at least reduce them to absolute minimum. Because mm. in our operations, the our paramount uh, concern is safety. And all of these technologies you've been talking about are interesting technologies, from the business perspective uh, elsewhere, they, these, these look like uh, enabling technologies. They're actually very interesting for business, for others. But in aviation, uh, we, some of these we regard as disruptive technologies. They change uh, the environment so quickly that they may uh, uh, cause a, a safety issue. So we are very, very strict and very uh, cautious when adopting technologies. A lot of the technologies uh, uh, the transition from one technology to another in aviation you will notice is, uh, takes some time. It is very advanced, but it is very, very, very slow in adopting to new technology. Mm -hmm. and, the, and all that is because of the need to be cautious when taking on technologies. Mm. Mm. But many of the technologies we have, uh, through a very elaborate process, through a rigorous uh, testing and rigorous assessment, safety assessment, we've managed to, uh, to take on some of these uh, new technologies especially the transition that we've been talking about from, uh, um, from conventional system to satellite-based systems. We've moved uh, to mainly a paper-driven uh, system in the past and some uh, uh, analog systems to digital database systems. All of those have a, a very strong cyber security behind them. And, 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 and you talk about satellite. Uh, it also concerns because then we're exposed to the rest of the world but how safe are we, on a scale of 1 to 10, how safe are we as a country, technology-wise, and also being tracked or being hacked and all these things, because there's the dark web for people to be able to get open source technology and be able to hack things like that, cybercrime, all these things, people stealing identity. Can't things like that be mimicked and someone be able to either divert a flight or be able to move it in a certain direction, give it different instructions? Are these possible, and how safe are we? Scale of one Thank to ten. Much. Okay, from a scale of one to ten, in aviation we, we measure ourselves uh, uh, from. Um, uh, uh, I mean, it's not one to ten. If I looked at it in terms of percentage, mm. there's a requirement. We must meet the requirement. Normally, wow. our requirements on safety and security a minimum is, standard is ninety-nine point seven, ninety-nine point nine. So we ensure that our systems are that safe. Okay. You can, we do not compromise on that. We even for also systems. A system, say, we could accept that one system could be, say, disturbed, but we always have a backup. Okay. We'll have a backup, we do, in the worst case, go back to the original method. Hmm. So the, the, all the systems are covered in terms of safety and security. Okay. We, always, we have what is called redundancy. Mm. All systems are designed in such a way that they are redundant systems. They have safety redundancy, security redundancy, and continuity. All that is built in within the system, and that's why our professionals are really 
uh, indoctrinated into this safety culture. Oh, okay. Everything that we do is uh, really geared towards safety. Safety of us, everything safety of us. I love that you're not just talking about training, yeah. but indoctrination into mm. a safety it's culture. It's a very serious. It's a very while serious. Timothy was asking, that reminded me of the Kenyan gentleman who worked into the government system, created a new constituency, and he received a salary. But we don't expect that in civil aviation. <laughs> <do we? laughs> no, it's not something that is. <laughs> Which we, we would never expect something like that. <laughs> Mr. Luja, let me come to you. The aviation industry is one which takes huge amounts of money to be able to deal and run and control and maintain, but also quite one that takes forever. For example, when we look at looking just at our background and we're looking at that beautiful Airbus, Ugandan Airbus right there, and many people are thinking, the, the question that always came was, when will we break even? Because it's a very expensive venture. But at that comes the discussion of how do we attract more in terms of cargo to be coming through, uh, coming in and out, but also passengers. So are there any sort of measure, uh, measures that Uganda Civil Aviation Authority is looking at to attract more and more passengers into our airspace that will get to a time and think Entebbe International Airport is too small for the kind of traffic that we are having? Yes, we have quite a number of those. Government through UCAA operates a liberalized air transport system. That means free entry and exit of air operators. But that enables us to attract as many operators as possible because okay. there is no limitation mm. on those that are joining our airspace. And in that regard, we have embarked on a campaign to ensure that we sign as many bilateral air service agreements as possible with other countries. As I speak now, Uganda has a total of 51 bilateral air service agreements with other countries. The most recent that we have signed include that with Finland, Colombia, and Nigeria. The Nigerian one in included a review of the routing. So that enables us to ensure that uh, we enhance connectivity. But when you look at the air operators that have, for instance, recently joined our airspace as part of that effort, you recall that uh, Airlink joined the Ugandan airspace as to fill the gap when <coughs> South African Airways ex exited. Mm. Not only Airlink, we have uh, the Dubai route that uh, is very busy. We attracted Air Arabia, which now flies to Sharjah in UAE. Previously, we had Emirates fly Dubai, which were flying mainly from Entebbe to Dubai. So when Air Arabia came on board, they are now flying to another town in UAE, which is Sharjah. Besides Air Arabia, they're coming on board of the national airline and commencing flights to still destinations in Dubai, South Africa, and many others in the region is all part of that effort of ensuring that we attract as many more passengers and cargo as possible. Because even the national airline now is handling a sizable amount of cargo because the Airbus has quite some tons that it can carry, and that is helping in that regard. Hmm. Yes. Okay, now, uh, while you were even speaking about that, it took me back to a number of series of conversations of misinformation of mm -hmm. you having to deal with the public. And, and there was this whole, um, you know, scathing headline that came through uh, Uganda, uh, Uganda um, Entebbe International Airport mortgaged. Mm -hmm. And then came in the discussion of the H-U-E-N, which sounds Chinese as U-N or mm -hmm. something like that. I want you to clear the air for that, for the people who are watching, because many said, oh, yes, it's sold. Now, you mm -hmm. see, when you type UN, what you see is the Entebbe International Airport. But also, what are some of those discussions and um, areas, scenarios that you've had to deal with regarding misinformation and a lot of misunderstood mm -hmm. concepts that you've also picked a lesson from that the public also needs to understand? Uh, thank you very much, Mildred. The HUEN that you have picked on is an interesting one. But before you I delve, sold our airport. Before I delve so? <laughs> uh, into, into it, let me start with that background of that story. Yes. It was uh, a front page headline in one of the dailies that Entebbe Airport given away for cash. Unfortunately, that story then, I think it was 2021, the headline was totally divorced from the content of the story. The details there. Yes, in. yes, indeed it was. And of course, we went ahead to, pro to clarify these issues at all levels. Our minister went on the floor of parliament and made a statement, even the Minister of Information clarified this, that much as we secured a loan from Exim Bank of China to the tune of 200 million US dollars for upgrade and expansion of Entebbe International Airport, this was purely a loan given on very good terms mm. that we are paying it back in 20 years 
at an interest rate of 2%. And before we start repaying that loan, we were given a grace period of seven years okay. within which we are not paying any <coughs> principal, mm. um, rather interest. So that grace period, by the time this news started sp spreading, we were actually within the grace period of seven years. So it was as incorrect, as inaccurate as it was, but that was clarified at all levels. Even the Attorney General went on the floor of Parliament and clarified that government cannot give away an international asset, an asset like the international airport, the only one that we have. Even when we got that loan, the airport was not put up as collateral security for the loan. It is government of Uganda that guaranteed the loan. So all those clarifications were made and <coughs> duly the situation was clarified. So while it has, had been clarified, one of our colleagues in the journalism profession <coughs> went on uh, Twitter and posted what you're talking about. He wrote that go to Google and type H-U-E-N and see what comes up. Indeed, when you go to Google and type H-U-E-N, yes, because that is the International Civil Aviation Organization code for Entebbe International Airport. <coughs> so when you type H-U-E-N, it brings Entebbe International Airport. Now, the timing of that post was unfortunately, extremely unfortunate, because we had just cleared the news of the allegation of the sale of the airport, which was incorrect. Now, someone mentions H-U-E-N, which was sounding Chinese, <laughs> like you have rightly stated. <laughs> when, so yes. to most Ugandans, was seeing it as Huen, mm. and actually now connecting to the previous story and so. saying, indeed, this airport has been sold. But what was not communicated when people were told to type H-U-E-N was the fact that that ICAO code is not only given to Uganda, to the airport at Entebbe, but it is given to all airports in the world. <coughs> there is an ICAO code for each airport. And H, the H-U-E-N, mm. if you are to explain it properly, each letter has a meaning. The okay. first letter, H, stands for the region. Now that code is for the countries in the African and Indian Ocean, where we also fall. So H stands for the region of East Africa. Mm. The next letter, which is U, represents the country, and in our case it is Uganda. Then EN represents the airport, which in our case is Entebbe. Entebbe yes. So if, for instance, you are referring to Guru Airport, it would be H representing East African region, U representing Uganda, and GU representing Guru. So it would be Hugu. If, for instance, you are referring to an airport in Kenya, say Jomo Kenyatta International Airport, the code would be H, representing the East African region, K, representing Kenya, mm. and JK, representing Jomo, Jomo Kenyatta. Kenyatta. So it would be HKJK. Eventually, we gave that explanation. You know, every challenge is also an opportunity for you to educate to the masses. And educate, yes, yes, uh, so that was uh, <laughs> an unfortunate misinformation, but those are the things that we have to continue informing the public so that they know and appreciate this highly complex aviation industry. And that's why your office has to have an open door <laughs> policy so we can disturb you. <coughs> and and maybe, maybe yes. I need to add here. Yes. Mm. The genesis of this loan. This airport, as you know, Entebbe International Airport, was built in 1960s going into 70s. And because of that systems, of course they had been renovations and expansions like during Chogam. And time came when actually the systems were almost at the risk of being overtaken by the, 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 the times, you know. The systems are old, but we are operating in the modern world. So His Excellency the President actually requested the Chinese, and it is one of his visits there. Mm. And they agreed that they can come and help and give this money, although we are beginning to expand in our own way using some of our little resources, just like we are doing at the departure. And it could have taken such a long time. And he said, okay, you can come. And that's how that loan was negotiated with those very favorable terms. And then we started working on it. There is absolutely no reference to taking over the airport, as he has said. It was just simply a negotiated deal that was between the two states, and for them they are using the Exim Bank to fund it, but of course overseen by the Chinese government, and that's it. Mm. There is no 
It has been explained by our minister on several occasions, even on the floor of parliament, the country's attorney general, the minister of finance, everybody has explained it. So and we shall continue to explain it. And our airport is safe. Yes. Director General, I'll stay with you. Uh, the loan you're talking about is $200 million there from Exim Bank. <coughs> but let's focus on some of these things. Uh, uh, Kenya has moved a hub to Heathrow because of the flowers. They keep moving there. And my question to you, like Mildred had earlier on asked, what are we doing to expand the inflow of uh, travelers here? But also, should our focus be travelers or cargo? Now, as a technical person. Uh, thank you very much for asking that question. That's a very, very big question. We have been making a lot of efforts to attract these airlines here, as he has been explaining, mm. by signing bilateral air service agreements. But the real attraction, actually, which the country, I take this opportunity to tell the country, is about increasing the level of economic activity. Aviation, like any other business, follows economics. Mm -hmm. It does not <coughs> just come out of nowhere. I, I, I can tell you, people will not come here just to enjoy the services of an airport. It doesn't work like that, uh, viewers. It doesn't at all. People come here to have economic activities they are doing. People come here to see attractive features. Therefore, as a country, we must now put a lot of effort in developing our tourism industry. He has just been explaining that the majority of the people who use Entebbe International Airport, up to now they are still tourists. They are not, they are not just business, not, they are not conference. People attend conferences. They are still, the majority of them are tourists or other business people. So the quickest or the most sustainable thing to do is to get our economic activities attractive, our tourist centers attractive, Automatically, you will see business in Entebbe, and the airlines will come, mm -hmm. even without them being persuaded to come here. Now, for cargo, he has just indicated here that cargo, the cargo we have, is mainly agricultural, perishable cargo, especially for exports. Mm -hmm. we, it is high time Ugandans start producing for the market. Mm -hmm. I, and what do I mean? Producing those, pro those types of produce that are in high demand uh, in the world. And what again am I saying? If you are producing pineapples, you must know that the, the market needs these pineapples of this shape, of this color, of ripeness, and so on and so forth. The market is very, very sensitive about those. And now what does that mean? We must work with stakeholders, Minister of Agriculture and other people, the tourist sector, tourism board and others, mm. and we make this country, first of all, grow for export that is marketable, but also for attracting passengers, that's for cargo, for attracting passengers that come here to do economic activities or come to enjoy our tourist attractions. It doesn't start and end in the airport. It must be a collaborating effort by all. Of course, in so doing, we should also improve our hotels, our tour operators, the type of transport system that we have. This is really, really big area of focus that both the airport authorities and other downstream sectors must focus on to make sure that we, we, we attract people here. Airports and aviation are not always mainly for profit. They are not motivated by profits okay. as a first thing. Uh. Actually, we are at home and we are done when our safety requirements are complied with, mm -hmm. security, because what we get in that airport and aviation facilities, we again invest it. We don't make profits. Invest it for purposes of improving the facilities especially keeping abreast with the safety requirements 
of the industry globally. That's what we always do. We don't so much care about 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 uh, profits, only to the extent to which we earn money, sustain our operations. Mm. That's probably our profits. And I want to tell you that, uh, of course, the time here does not allow us to discuss this matter. It is not enough to just simply say that we have airlines, we have aviation facilities, we must all the time know that this is, these are facilitators for something else. Dubai, Dubai, you hear about this, this, this infrastructure of Emirates. is not making profits, I can tell you. The aim, the model, their model is to bring the world to Dubai. And profits, that they are achieving. Yes. Mm. Profits are made in other sectors. It has that multiplier effect. And that's what they have. They, you do you not see them emphasizing that they will get a shilling for a shilling in air in the air aircraft X. No. As long as you have brought people into Dubai, they have flooded the Dubai free uh, trade free zone mm. and bought many things. That is how they benefit. Actually, Director, and that is the model. You, you yes. actually mentioned that for yes. you, the safety, the security yes. is, is paramount above any yes. other thing as yes. you do. And um, I'm, I'm privy to information that Uganda is set to undergo some audits by ICAO, the International Civil Aviation Organization. When are they scheduled? How ready? Lest we will have some misinformation coming through <laughs> at some point in time. Are we ready for this? No, no actually. Uh, Talking of safety and security, as a contracting state, we are monitored and audited by the Global Aviate, uh, Aviation Agency called ICAO, just to make sure that we are keeping within compliance levels of the industry. Mm. And for, because of that, we have an audit for safety in September, uh, September this year. Okay. Just few months away mm. and we are preparing for that mm. to be able to and what are they testing they are testing our capacity to of to to, to oversee the industry okay to to, to to ensure compliance the industry is complying with aviation standards and recommended practice as promulgated all the time by ICAO and we are getting ready for that for and this is not the first time. For security, we shall be uh, audited in, in uh, 2024. Uh, and there are previous, of course, previous scores that we have got, which we don't want really to relax about okay. and continue to get. You can blow the trumpet ch quite, quite a bit. OK, well, we, for instance, we got 81 Point one percent. That would be a D two, I think. In the 20, <laughs> 2017 in terms, yes. for security. Yeah. We have no intention whatsoever of relaxing on that. Okay. And that was of course far above the average of that time of seventy one percent. We think we should now be in the region of ninety percent mm -hmm. when the audit comes. And many, many other areas and parameters. Of course the industry has expanded. And we must now be extremely work hard. Like there was no Uganda airline when the audit came, the other one, safety audit. Mm. Now the whole process of Uganda airline, its existence, its approval, its operations, its compliance levels are now part and parcel of that audit. That's why at times we are criticized for being stringent on the industry mm. because we are mindful that if we relax on certain things, we shall pay heavily as a regulator. The okay. Yes, and director General, let me come to you. Uh, yes. You, Director Richard, you have exhaustively told us about safety and security. Now let's get to the economics. You have done so well, you're at 81%. I could even give you the 90 you're looking for now. But how do we deal with the economics? One, how are you doing the interlinkages between you and other agencies? The reason of that whistleblowing, social media, corruption, extortion, how are you doing the linkage in there? Because it is frustrating an ordinary Ugandan to have the experience there. 
That's one. Two, what is our comparative advantage? And what is the next airport after Entebbe? Because at some point, Entebbe has to get exhausted. <laughs> so is that the, by the way, that extortion to your knowledge, let me first explain this once again. There was that spark. But we were doing quite a lot in containing those, those levels of my practices. As you saw, when we were able to show the world that uh, what we were doing, you saw we were actually dealing, dealing with those people who were who, from different agencies, whom we were seeing, whom we were not, uh, who were uh, promoting extortions. You, you know that. Mm -hmm. And we were actually all the time putting restrictions on some practices, we were uh, dealing with other agencies on how to control their own stuff. But because of that spark, we were also put in, 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 in a situation where we were drastic. But otherwise, on a normal, and we know why it came about. It's not, by the way, don't think that that spark was just there. There are other fights somewhere, somewhere which we know about. And that's the linkage Director we General are looking for. Now, the linkage between stakeholder sectors, like tourism sector, for instance, we have quite, quite, quite a lot of dealings with the tourism. Could be better, but could even be improved. But we are trying, for instance, we, are, we have requested and we have been given to be on the board of youth of Uganda Tourism Board because we have inputs to the decisions that take place there. We have been holding meetings with, say, flower exporters, horticultural exporters, and trying to show them that this is, we have facilities here that they must use, say, the, the cargo, our cargo facility. Because we, if we don't have those, we will not be able to do that. We've been able to do a lot of uh, 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 collaboration with hosp hospitality centers, mm. with tour operators who operate, tax drivers in the airport, and to be able to smoothen uh, how we receive people here in the country. And now we are going to, to embark on, it, on uh, improving up country airports. I think you heard that. We have the backing of the president on that and he has already given some directives so, so that we make it, we make the experience of our visitors all through from Entebbe International Airport to even other areas, especially those in the centers of attraction in the country, in the, in the, in the tourism uh, area, zones. You were talking again about, are we about to get another airport? Although we are working on Entebbe, and expanding it and making facilities better. If of course, you know we are also uh, helping uh, together with the Ministry of Works. The Works is the lead sector in, in working on Kabale. But we've been brought on board to are also... Are we that to Kabalega International Airport now? Sorry, sorry, we have changed it to Kabalega International Airport. Uh, yes, uh, that name, is dear to me, you know the, that. The, the name, yeah, yeah, you know that. <laughs> the name has been Kabale, but mm. recently uh, the cabinet changed it to Kabalega International Airport. So we take in the career, we shall give technical advice. And eventually, when it is completed, probably we will, it will be in our hands because we are the authority mm. that manages airports in Uganda. And improve the rest of the regional airports. Okay. Yes. Uh, Director Richard, climate is one of the things that we discuss in this country. Uh, one is, uh, the last one was an incident of birds and a plane on the runway uh, migrating from one area to another. But two, there is also fumes from the planes that are there. What are you doing about climate and the environment as an authority? Mm, thank you very much. Climate and environment is a is uh, one of those concerns that has been highlighted now recently by, by ICAO. In fact, there's a specialized uh, annex on that. But uh, the facts uh, re related to, to, to climate is that the, the, the pollution out of av aviation with, within Africa 
is very quite minimal. It's quite minimal. I think it's uh, nearly about two percent of the global uh, emissions. Mm. So it's so it's uh, quite uh, insignificant. We the, the African continent are not the main polluters, but uh, even with that, even in that situation, when we uh, I was telling you about our efficiency in airspace, some of the measures that we take uh, for improving our efficiency is uh, to reduce the climatic uh, uh, impact in form of uh, uh, reduced emissions. And these, uh, so some of these projects that we've got, especially the, the implementation in the airspace, are uh, geared to reducing that airspace, that uh, those emissions sound. For those, those, uh, those who live in Kampala maybe, or those who live in, on the flight path may have noticed in Uganda that uh, the the, the, the aircraft that pass over us are quite silent. They, 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 are, they are not as loud. And all this is a deliberate, out of deliberate effort. Those procedures that we, are, that, that we, are, we talk about, for instance, the, 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 the continuous descent where an aircraft comes in and goes straight down mm -hmm. uh, with the, the least uh, uh, efficiency in energy, all those contribute to the reduction of uh, um, fuel burn and reduction of the pollution to the environment. We've got those uh, other procedures where we have uh, uh, continuous descent. You uh, come out of Entebbe, you go as high as possible in a straight line. Uh, all those are measures that are geared to, and there are other measures that are out there in, in the industry where we need to measure. We are required, and, and it's coming in, in the industry, where we are required to measure. For every operation, we are required to measure how much in, in form of uh, yeah. fuel emissions. Mm, this is a global process. We, it, it, it is an international effort. This international effort has its uh, uh, level of development in, in Africa. In Africa, we've got uh, 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 some, some mandate that has been set. Some dates have been set. We have been get, given targets. And we, we, uh, we are, uh, as the program uh, rolls out, we'll be meeting those targets as required. Director, but we're very concerned about that. Uh, and uh, ju just one more question before I hand over to Mildred. The black gold, oil and gas, how is aviation positioning itself? Did you, did you, uh, have, we need to answer that thing on bad hazard. Yes, bad yes, hazard. Yes, 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 yes. Uh, because and, and I can maybe yes. Yes. Mm. The Entebbe, the, the location of Entebbe, mm. as you know, is a bad sanctuary actually. Mm. And we have a specialized unit of bad, what, what we, bo we call bad control, uh, working on that hazard, possible hazard. And we really have a working unit that deals with that. But recently, I think because of the dist uh, destroying habitats of birds, I think birds, as they move around, they see an environment of an airport, still intact almost, with green grass, and they want to be there. They have increased of recent, just because they have nowhere else to be. If it is retained, it has been removed, as you know, because of other developments. So now, it has made it import, uh, important, uh, necessary rather, that we now have to deal with more birds than we have ever done. But even then, they are really, really under control. Just a few occasions. If actually we are not controlling it, then you would see swarms and swarms of birds. It seems there is something that has tampered with the habitats. And we, are, we have an ecological study which we have actually <coughs> uh, commissioned to make sure that it guides us on how now to deal with the increased uh, menace of the birds. But actually, we are not regarded as one of those airports that have very many of those hazards that are not controlled mm -hmm. as of now. We still are far, far, far below what you would call a situation going out of control. Okay. Mm -hmm. yes. in, a, in as much as we're gifted by nature. Mr. Luja, mm -hmm. I want to come to you. Um, for any first-time traveler, you literally have a sleepless night. You, you want to set your alarm 10 hours earlier and you want to be at the airport. But there is a bit of anxiety, lack of knowledge, lack of information of what's exactly required. Mm. And I think that was one of the basis for the extortion claims that happened in the recent wave of social media uh, discussions with regards to airport and civil aviation. 
What are some of those basic requirements for a first time traveler that you would uh, recommend for them so you're not caught on the wrong side or if someone is not fleecing you because mm -hmm. you clearly do not understand what is required? Uh, thank you very much for that. As I go into it, allow me to just add on to what Diggy was talking about in relation to the birds. Mm. The other issue that we are experiencing at Entebbe in relation to birds lately, there is a changing pattern, especially the migratory birds from Europe. There is this particular season when they used to come to Entebbe. That season has kind of changed and of late the pattern has changed. That's why you saw at the beginning of this year we had a lot of burn swallows coming in in January yet that never used to be the pattern before. So that mm -hmm. also has contributed to the increase in, in birds flocking in Tebe. But of course we are managing them through that buzzard control unit that he has mentioned. Moving back straight to the basic requirements for a passenger traveling through Entebbe International Airport, which is key for especially the first time traveler. One, we require that first you have a passport that is valid, that has not expired. On top of that, check the destination country where you're going to, whether it requires a visa or not. If you are, for instance, traveling in the region, you will not need a visa. But if the country you're going to requires a visa, get it first. Two, purchase a ticket, which you can have printed or online. But we encourage a return ticket for various reasons, because there are circumstances under which a passenger may be allowed to, to travel on a one-way ticket. So if you are using a one-way ticket, you need to fulfill the requirements for a one-way ticket. For instance, a passenger who is going to a country where they have evidence of residence, resident permit, that can use a one-way ticket. Or well, if you're a student going to a country and you have a student pass, you can use a one-way ticket. So those circumstances for one-way ticket are there. But if you don't fulfill them, you are required to have a return ticket. Why? Because there's this vice of human trafficking mm. that we have at Entebbe International Airport. And because of that vice, we have noticed that human traffickers normally give their victims one-way ticket to the destination. They also give them another one-way ticket, bringing them back from that destination. What happens that the moment this trafficked victim reaches the destination, this trafficker cancels the other one-way ticket, bringing them back. And most of the cases that we have registered at Interview of Human Trafficking, they have that history and background. So mm -hmm. because of that security consideration, it is pertinent that a person has a return ticket, and that's why we emphasize it. Now, having had a return ticket, you also need to look at the requirements <coughs> of the destination country that you are going to. For instance, some countries will require a yellow fever vaccination card. For instance, if you are going to South Africa or China or Tanzania, but not all countries require yellow fever vaccination. So if the country you're going to does not require yellow fever vaccination, we do not enforce it at Entebbe. And that is one of the measures that we have harmonized that the DG was talking about earlier on. Mm. Two, also still check with your airline. As part of the requirements for the destination, a few countries have maintained restrictions of COVID-19, just a few. Some may ask you to have a, a vaccination card or COVID-19 PCR tests. But as I speak now, those are very few countries. So if the destination does not require that, we removed that requirement at Entebbe, you do not have to have that. Even when you are coming back into the country, all passengers returning to Uganda do not ha need to have a COVID-19 PCR certificate or vaccination. That was removed in harmonization with the Ministry of Health, and it is one of the areas that have enhanced the passenger experience as we speak now. Now, those are the basic requirements for a passenger. But we have another category of passengers, which we refer to as migrant, wor migrant workers. Mm. These are our sisters and others going to countries, especially in the Middle East, for employment. Now, for that category of passenger, besides these basics that I've mentioned, there is an additional requirement that government put up through the Ministry of Gender, Labor and Social Development that they need to go through licensed farms, labor externalization farms that are licensed by the Minister of Gender. If you have not gone through that farm and you are an individual, you still need to get a clearance letter from the Minister of Gender, Labor and Social Development. So if you're a migrant worker to the Middle East for employment in that category, you need to take care of that other aspect on top of the other requirements. But once you have that, the other major need now 
for the passenger is to ensure that they are at the airport in time. Most of the international airlines close their check-in counters one hour prior to the flight's departure time from Entebbe International Airport. So we advise passengers through Entebbe International Airport that on departure, it is advisable to get to the airport at least three hours prior to your scheduled departure time so that you go through the entire process smoothly. Remember there is some traffic jam on Entebbe Road if you have not used the express. And even when you reach the airport itself as you enter the gate, there's that security checkpoint. If it is peak time, there may be a queue mm. at peak time. So to go through all that smoothly, if you have given yourself three hours, chances are that you will not miss your flight in any way. Some of the complaints we got in January during that social media crisis were missing of flights. Yeah. And when we interrogated these, we realized that most people who missed their flights actually missed them because they reached the airport late. Someone, because they know that the check-in counters close one hour to the flight, gets to the airport one hour to the flight. Remember, this person has not gone through these other security processes. The check-in counter closes after you. The one hour we're talking about, you should have checked in already. But so if you get to the airport one hour, you don't have ample time to go through the processes and cross over in time. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. Director Rehesi, with technology and the evolving issues happening around technology, there is now this um, new craze of the need for drones and, um, you know, and, and manned area vehicles. For, it could be leisure, business, or whatever, sports, and, and whatever it is. How are you ensuring that there are aspects of safety and security in as much as we want people to take the full advantage of these new technologies. And I mean, if I have my money to be able to take use of that technology, I can be able to take it up. Thank you very much. Maybe before I answer a question, I'll touch one of the questions I asked before relating to this, uh, the- Oil and gas. Oil and, oil and gas. gas, oil and oh, gas. Yes. Sorry about that. Yeah, um, it, is, it is obvious that the oil and gas, the refinery is, uh, uh, the refinery is to be built in, in Hoima. And uh, uh, as uh, aviation, we are the first infrastructure, the prerequisite pre infrastructure that is locating itself right there. Mm -hmm. So we are really within the, the that oil and gas in that way, in, in two ways. In the other way is that uh, according to the, the plans that have been published by the, um, the oil authority, is that the first product, the first product from the refinery is likely to be Avigas. This is the gas, this is the fuel that is used by aircraft. Mm. So it's likely that we'll position ourselves in such a way that aircraft and operators can make these uh, technical stops to uh, consume that Avigas that will be produced out of this refinery. Okay. It is one of those uh, strategies that is set within that. But then uh, coming to the issue of, dr of drones, okay, drones, you could call them UAVs, um, okay, we're not referring to these other drones okay, that the, taxi I'm, I'm type. Talking about, okay, the, the <laughs> yes. unmanned aerial vehicles, yeah. or in the industry we now call them uh, remotely piloted uh, aircraft and other names. We, as I said earlier, is that we, we look at these technologies uh, very cautiously. We're excited that they are there, but we look at them very cautiously in, um, in that these are disruptive technologies. They are very useful for commercial, for business, for photography, for uh, the, even uh, the, the, the relief medicine, and the, the, uh, we, we, all of this could be harnessed to that. But we've got, uh, 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 we're taking it step by step. We've got a process through which uh, we ensure, we've got a very rigorous process, uh, and it applies to the rest of the world as well, where we've got a rigorous process of accepting them in the operation. Because as we, uh, we, we've got to move step by step, from initially allowing, allowing them into the country is one thing. Uh, allowing them into operation, we then got to go through a stage where we allow them right now, even when we allow them, we allow them only in what is called segregated airspace. You bring your drone in, you go through the process of uh, getting it registered, paying its tax, you then get support from an MDA, one of the ministries, supports you uh, the, for, for in, in the industry, specifically the industry for which you're bringing the drone or the UAV, it, they go through, we go to, through a, a tripartite uh, arrangement where the ministry accepts it. It is taken to the military, the military then clear it, uh, which could be a, a long process. It is then brought to us to coordinate. And the way we do it is that uh, we segregate that space where you intend to work. For instance, if you intend to work over 
Kampala. Okay, Kampala may not be a good example. Say you want to work over somewhere in uh, Rera, uh, somewhere, say, in Masaka. We'd have to segregate that airspace to allow you to operate that drone. These drones, as much as they, if, for instance, as you said, birds, as a natural being, can be so dangerous to an aircraft, drones uh, really, we try as much as possible to keep away, to separate these uh, UAVs away, very far away from aircraft. We don't actually allow them to operate at airports, only in special circumstances, so we segregate that airspace. Over time, and through a rigorous process, we'll go to the state where they'll be integrated into uh, uh, space with other operations. In fact, there's a, the, 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 what we're looking at at the moment is to have a special area, uh, a special um, an area below 5,000, uh, where, where drones can operate freely. Or not freely as such, but in a, in a regulated mm -hmm. environment. Mm -hmm. So these spaces, even uh, world over, the, 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 air, the airspace is being divided into areas where these uh, can operate. And all that is because of uh, the, the safety and security. This could be very dangerous for, well, very useful for, for, for many things, but also they've got the downside. So the, the, the steps being taken are very cautious steps in introducing them. And, and uh, I think the starting point even for us here would be to bring the stakeholders on board by sensitization. The people that bring those drones, the, the, the agencies that bring them, those who intend to use them for business need to know the, 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 the pros and cons of having them. Okay. Yeah, and uh, these are some of the steps we're taking. But sooner or later, over time, they will be integrated, slowly integrated into the airspace and into the air operations. All right. I, I, I would like to come back to the DG because earlier on you talked about the multiplier effect of having the aviation industry up and running, although not necessarily looking at um, having profit or making profit out of that. Now, I know that COVID-19 disorganized us a little bit on what we're calling mice that we're picking up right now, the meetings, the incentives, these conferences and events. Uh, we're expecting the G77, the non Line movement. We're expecting a China summit and something like that. And these include high-profile guests, including heads of state. Is Uganda ready? Is our airspace ready? Can we be able to host this? <coughs> Thank you very much uh, again for asking that question. As in, uh, my colleague Hess has been talking, the airspace is no question. It's very, very ready. The airspace. Now, what we are talking about probably are ground facilities at the airport. We've been working together with the National Organizing Committee. In fact, there is an airport committee which, where we are members. And we have told them we have really agreed. I think we have also even been inspected. And the, the facilities that we have are enough. But also you know that we are working on facilities like those expansion projects, mm. uh, arrival and departure. That one we, we expect it to be completed and it will come in handy to handle those big numbers. You know we hosted Chogam. Yes. This is bigger than Chogamo, right? But those facilities are still there. The other question has been the parking of aircrafts. Right now we have measured and again measured with stakeholders, uh, security, other organizers, and we have found that we can park at least 76 aircrafts. At a go? At a go, at one go. Mark you, they, those can't even be there because they will come. Many of them come while going back like that. That is there. The, the other aspect of it was, of course, uh, how to work collaboratively with other organizers and make sure that we receive people in two areas. The VVIP, you know VVIP is a separate terminal. Yeah. And that really is enough for the heads of state that will be here and other dignitaries. And that is, has been earmarked as an area for receiving all dignitaries that will be coming there. Some of the groups that come with them, either before or after, will be received like other normal passengers. Because the majority of people who attend up to now will of course come with these normal, these normal scheduled airlines. And those ones we shall be receiving them like other visitors, but also 
who is the help of the people in the ministries of foreign affairs, internal affairs, those who comprise that committee. So we are extremely ready and with the opening of that in, at the end of August, that uh, expansion, we will really be more than ready to receive those. Uh, the other aspect was the parking, I think, for VIPs, the vehicles that will be coming to pick VIPs. Again, we have started on modernizing the site. The site is there, but we want to make it modernized. And together with UPDF, Engineers Brigade, we are really almost done, and we are going to start working on it in the coming few weeks. Mm. Yes, so, if you say, are you ready? Yes. You're more than ready. As a country, we are ready. As an airport, we are ready. And, and, and Mr. Luja, that's why I also bring in the, uh, we've had so many expos, <coughs> and one that is coming up soon, which is directly linked to you, uh, this sector is the Aviation Expo, or the air show that is coming through. What is this about? What do we intend to achieve out of this expo? A country like Uganda, which we've always referred to as the Pearl of Africa, not us, but uh, the persons who refer to it as such. Uh, thank you very much, Mildred. And before I get into the expo, permit me to continue from where the dig is stopped mm. in relation to these facilities that are being put up. You remember he mentioned the terminal extension that is going to be ready ahead of this hosting of the G77 summit. But we ha also have another terminal building that is currently under construction by the China Communications Construction Company. That terminal building is expected to be completed. It's a completely new terminal connecting to the current terminal. It will be completed by July 2024. And when you add all the capacity together, currently the terminal capacity we have is 2 million passengers a year maximum. But when all these projects are completed in July 2024, we shall have capacity to cater for at least 3.5 million passengers okay. in the terminal building. Now moving back to the Aviation Expo, which is scheduled for June 22nd, to 24th, 2022 at Entebbe International Airport. It has a major highlight, which is the air show, that provides an opportunity to especially those who have never flown to have a chance to fly for the first time. There will be a minimal entry fee of 50,000 per person entering the Aviation Expo area because there are lots of activities that are going to happen. Mm -hmm. For instance, we have lots of stakeholders that have joined us, including uh, this expo is organized by the Uganda Professional Pilots Association with support from UCAA and other stakeholders. Among those stakeholders supporting us is the UPDAF, which will provide flights information. You know that exciting thing that they usually do at major functions, mm. they will do that. <coughs> Uganda Police Air Wing is on board and they will also do exciting things in the air for all those that are coming for the expo to see. The people in the expo will have an opportunity to enter static aircraft. There will be static aircraft displays. Oh, I actually thought you were going to fly us for 50,000 shillings. No. We were going to bring the entire village. <laughs> no, 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 no. The flying cost uh, is also there. I'm okay. coming to it. Yeah. But uh, I'm still talking about these other exciting things. For instance, a person will have a chance to enter aircraft, mm. view the cockpit, and even sit there and take photographs, especially people who have never entered aircraft. Mm. These things will be on display and are available for them. Those who have paid the 50,000 to enter. Now the category that is going to fly, we shall be flying them for between 30 to 40 minutes. And the, the fee for the flight is 200,000, the ordinary flight, but the, the one categorized as VIP will be paying 300,000. Now, those are the ones that will be flown in bigger aircraft, like the Airbus, among others. 300,000, and you fly for 30 minutes, 30 to 40 minutes, within Ugandan airspace and back to Entebbe. Normally, Kampala is a no-fly zone, but because of this air show, we have already secured special permission from the authorities to fly over Kampala. So, for instance, those that will fly in smaller aircraft will have a chance to fly low and be able to see some of the things that they usually areas they usually are, things like Nambori, Wino Market, or even see some of the malls <laughs> where you normally spend time. Okay. So that will be part of the highlight for those. When we last had this air show 10 years ago, uh, oh. when Uganda was celebrating Uganda at 50, mm. we had a couple uh, that had just wedded actually. They came and uh, had a chance to also fly on their wedding day. But we had lots of people from across the country coming in 
and especially utilizing that chance to fly without even needing a passport or a visa, <laughs> as long as you have your 200,000 <laughs> or 300,000 for come the VIP please, flight, yes. please come and take and that break flight the curse of never and using enjoy. There will be lots of entertainment throughout yeah. the day, mm. and we encourage schools to join because this is good for the students. There will be mm. career guidance sessions. The different air operators will be exhibiting and providing career guidance in different areas. Normally, when you talk about the aviation industry to schools and students, most of them think about piloting as the main thing. Mm. But there are many other fields, like he has been referring to in his area, air traffic control and others. We shall have our air traffic controllers, among others, there in an exhibition stall, providing career guidance to students on some of the courses they can undertake to become air traffic controllers okay. who do not fly aircraft but talk to pilots on a daily basis and directing them pass here, do not pass there, mm -hmm. that kind of scenario. Okay, that's going to be interesting. I saw Timothy already calculating how much money and how many members of the family will be coming. For Tim anyway, as, as we put down this uh, landing gear, uh, I'll start with Director uh, Richard. Your parting shots and we'll go all the way back to the DJ. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Uh, thank you to the viewers. My uh, parting shot would be that uh, it is a good opportunity for us, uh, uh, CAA, in fact, even as uh, air navigation services, to at least share with the viewers some of the work we do. And maybe uh, beyond that, we actually do not only uh, secure the, the safety in our own uh, airspace, we also are engaged in, uh, in efforts beyond that. Because we are in, involved in an effort under the ESC, the East African community, where we are looking at have a common seamless airspace. We're also looking at uh, s setting up a similar uh, system, the, the entire region, the whole of the Africa and Indian Ocean region under COMESA. So there's a lot of uh, activities. We call upon uh, uh, students mainly. This is a season for the students having, uh, uh, doing uh, uh, industrial, in the industrial work. And maybe they, this is an area that uh, a career that they could uh, pick on and uh, get involved in or take interest in, including uh, the, the, that uh, exhibition that will be provided at the... Mm. But I thank you for hosting us here and being able to listen to our, uh, some of the services we offer okay. in their space. Uh, Vian, over to you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, maybe just to remind users of the facilities <coughs> at Entebbe International Airport that as you depart Entebbe International Airport, if you have visited and parked there, there are options of paying for parking, which include mobile money. You just need to dial star 227 hash mm. using your mobile phone, and you follow the prompts so that you pay for that parking using mobile money and exit comfortably without going to the pay machines where they are. Otherwise, I thank NBS and UBC ha However, something, the much. parking fees are exorbitant. Mm. I've just come for a pickup. You could mm. probably offer and say, first 40 minutes free, and then uh, the mm. rest you can start paying per hour. No, they are, they, are not, uh, they are not exorbitant at all, because if you look at the fee, the starting rate is 2,000 for mm. the first 30 minutes. If you compare the cost of parking in Kampala at some of the malls, for instance, it's not any different, but we are talking about an international airport here. That rate, time, you if you compare it with, uh, with the parking rates at other airports in the region, okay. it is definitely quite competitive. Okay. But thank you very much for the opportunity <laughs> <laughs> to explain to Ugandans. Mm -hmm. Lastly, the Director General. Thank you very much. Uh, Midred and uh, your colleague, and thank you all of you, all of you viewers. It is yet a very, very good opportunity to come here and explain to the real uh, owners of these aviation facilities, the Ugandans, what is going on in our aviation industry. And it is always good that we are here. But I would like really, really to encourage Ugandans to make to know that aviation is there for all of you. First of all, Uganda is not linked to the sea, as you know. It can only be linked to the sea through air. Air is free. The air transport is free and can have linkages elsewhere. And we need to come up and use our aviation facilities much more than we have so far done. 
because they will enable us to have very seamless uh, transport means to reach the sea like other countries, to, reach, to interconnect between the countries and make sure that we ease our transport system. But we want also to inform the general public that we are determined, very, very determined, to make especially our aviation facilities, especially in TV, to be a hub and to look to be competitive like any other uh, uh, airport in the world. But we shall continue to be cautious and move with the level of uh, uh, activity that is expected in the, in the airport and not just come up to build things that will eventually be white elephants. We shall move slowly, but we shall surely reach there. And we want to encourage Ugandans to be available to use their facility, both in the cargo and as passengers, to make sure that our industry grows. Luckily enough, we now have a hubbing airline, Uganda Airlines. And I want to encourage ourselves to as much as possible use Uganda Airlines and try to make it expand. When it expands, it also expands the home uh, airport, which is in Tebe, and we shall sooner than later have enough airport users in form of passengers to make sure that our airport is fully utilized and our aviation facilities are used by the owners, the Ugandans, as we expand our industry for the future. Thank you very much, and I want once again to thank you for listening to us and, 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 our t and the, the team uh, of colleagues who are here. Thank okay. you very much. And uh, we're really grateful that you came through to be able to listen to some of the things here. Gentlemen, thank you so much for coming through. Uh, this was more of uh, teaching the people of what we're doing and yeah. also credit <clears throat> to you for really championing safety and security. Now we need to get the economics of it there. But uh, from the dynamic duo of Mildred and myself, yeah. on myself, I really appreciate everything you have had here and also the interaction that has been on social media with both of us here. We haven't been able to read some of those. It was just too much feedback there. But for yes. me, Timothy, thank you very much and God bless you. And yes, uh, thank you very much to NBS TV and UBC TV Inspiring Uganda for making sure that this comes to pass. Let's continue uh, with this conversation on social media because that is the kind of space that we're in. And probably prepare your 200,000, 300,000 to be able to fly for just a few minutes. For those of you who've never had this experience with an entrance fee of just 50,000. From myself, Mildred Tohaise and Timothy, we want to say good morning because it's already uh, midnight and see you in a few on the morning breeze.